Can you keep a secret? Me too. Ever had anyone approach you that way? There are times when there are secrets we need to keep. Things ought to be held close to the vest, as the terminology has been used. Maybe, maybe there's an engagement of a friend, but you're not allowed to, to say anything publicly yet because they've not informed all of their family. Grandma and Grandpa aren't aware, and uh, they need to make sure more family members know before uh, they spread the news too broadly. They want to make sure that they find out from them, so to speak. Perhaps it's a, a pregnancy, and it's the same way. You, you're someone you, you know and love, a close friend is expecting, but you're not allowed to, to spill the beans because they need to inform some others first. Maybe it's a, a job opportunity or a big move. Between us, our family couldn't wait to spill the beans when we knew we, we would be privileged to, to be moving to Forest Hill and working with the congregation here. We, we were bubbles about to burst because it was big news, but things needed to be done in a proper and discreet way. Aren't we glad that we don't have to be discreet and keep it a secret when it comes to the gospel of Christ? Isn't it wonderful that Jesus hasn't looked at us and said, shh, keep it a secret. Keep it to yourself. Yet, so often, it can be a challenge to make sure that we are excited about the good news that we have. It's interesting, throughout Jesus' ministry, there were times where the idea of go ye on to, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature was far removed from the actual speech he was conveying. There were times when he said, go and tell no one. There were times when he said, go and tell only some. It's only upon the arrival at the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Consider some of those events. Consider the reasons why, as best we can ascertain, when we can ascertain, why it was he would say, go and tell none. Go and tell only some, or go and tell all. Go and tell none. Mark 1, 25, the first time Jesus ever said, shh, as recorded for us, it was said to a, a devil, a demon, an unclean spirit that was being cast from an individual in the synagogue. Jesus said, hold thy peace. Fomao is the Greek word. Literally, muzzle yourself. Jesus told this unclean spirit, be quiet and get out of him. Well, this is the only time he told an unclean spirit to be quiet. The one that he silenced on this occasion was one that was saying are you come to torment us i know who you are jesus you son of the holy we know who you are you're, you're deity in the flesh jesus said you be quiet mark 1 24 and 25 a similar event he uh, uh 34 rather he suffered the demons not to speak because they knew him and he didn't want them conveying to everyone the fullness of his identity Mark 3, 12, similar occasion. Jesus would silence the demon that he was evicting from, from a poor soul simply because the demon knew him and Jesus did not want hell's endorsement. Now, it's worth considering that there are times when Jesus said, Go and tell none. You be quiet. You keep this to yourself. You do not make me known. One reason is because he didn't want Satan's endorsement. Now, that doesn't apply to us, does it? No one in here is a demon. Or at least, I don't think you are, are you? No. No, we're, we're God's children. And so, when he said, go and tell no one to them, that's not for us. We've got news we can share. There was, it was a matter of Satan's endorsement. Jesus didn't want it. But then there's also an occasion, Mark 1, He's just healed a leper. The leper that said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus not only said, I will be thou cleansed. He touched him. He made physical contact. Something that this man had not experienced throughout his leprosy without making someone else unclean. But with Jesus, it wasn't the leprosy that was contagious. It was the cleanliness. And when he touched the man, I will be thou clean. And he was cleansed. Jesus then instructed the leper, Mark 1, See thou say nothing to any man. Well, now, wait a minute. This is a leper. He's about to bubble over. 
<laughs> he has great news. See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself unto the priest, and offer for an offering those things that Moses required in the law for a testimony unto them. You go and you offer for your cleansing what was required in Leviticus 14 for the cleansing of a leper. Jesus told this man to tell no one as a, a requirement of the law. The leper, though cleansed in Leviticus 15 when the law was given, the ordinances were described, even when the leper was physically and biologically cleansed, he still had to be recognized as clean and make an offering before accepted back into the fellowship of his people. Jesus tells this leper, you're cleansed. But before you say anything to anyone, you go and you be recognized as cleansed in accordance with the law. Go and tell none. Sometimes it was because of Satan's endorsement. Sometimes it was because of the law's requirement with the leper. And then there's a sense in which this was said for prophecy's fulfillment. Let's depart from the book of Mark for just a moment. Thumb a few pages to the left into the book of Matthew. Matthew 12, picking up at verse 16. The Pharisees have uh, held a council about how they can destroy him, and Jesus knows that he withdraws. He's healing people. Verse 16, and he charged them that they should not make him known. Here he is performing wondrous works and miracles, healing, and he tells those that are there, don't tell anyone. Do not make me known. Do not make me manifest. Why? Matthew gives an inspired explanation. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of Elias the prophet. Here's the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. God's promised servant, the suffering servant of Isaiah, the Messiah that was so prophesied throughout Isaiah's writings and especially near the end of Isaiah's writings. Here's that servant, the one that was well pleasing to God. I'll put my spirit in him. He'll show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry. He's not going to be self-publicizing. He's not going to be self-promoting. He's not going to be trying to gather and amass some kind of a physical following. He shall not strive nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Not only was he not a self-promoter, but many were not inclined to hear him. Jesus was not a narcissist. Jesus would be ill-suited to sit at the table with so many uh, of the religious leaders of today who only live to receive accolades, just as he was ill-suited to sit at the table with the Pharisees in his day because they weren't suited to sit with him. Jesus was not a self-promoter. He was not one that was gathering some kind of a physical army. Instead, verse 20, he was gentle. A bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flag shall he not quench until he bring forth judgment unto victory. His efforts would be global. Judgment to the Gentiles. He would be gentle, not promoting self, not breaking even a reed. And he would be guaranteed. He'll bring forth judgment to victory. He'll accomplish what he came to do. Now, keep those thoughts in mind. The non-self-promoting, but the so often dismissed servant uh, that Isaiah foretold. Notice how that comes into play in Jesus' life. Many would not hear him. Well, that was the case with Jesus. Matter of fact, that's why he spoke in parables. Remember Mark 4, beginning in verse 9, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Jesus, why are you speaking in parables? So that hearing they'll hear and not hear. Because there were so many that had ears, but they didn't have anything in between them. They would hear what Jesus had to say, but they would not accept it, process it, acknowledge it. Jesus was careful not only with His words, but with His works. Because there were those that refused to listen. Move forward and see how this fulfillment of prophecy comes into play as depicted in Mark's record. Mark 5, picking up at verse 43, he's just resurrected the daughter of Jairus, that ruler of the synagogue. Everyone said she's dead. When Jesus uh, arrived, he said, no, she's asleep. They laughed him to scorn. He invited them to leave the room. He took with him the parents, 
Peter, James, and John, and he said, Maid, arise. Young girl, arise. Mark 5, 43, after she's resurrected, Jesus tells his parents, charge them straightly that no man should know it. Now, wait a minute, Lord. We just got back coming to get you and our daughter's dead. And you tell us not to tell anyone? That's right. That no man should know it. Why? Because he wasn't a self-promoter. Because he wasn't trying to amass some kind of mere physical following. And especially during his ministry in Capernaum, he had enough of the curious multitudes that were following him just to see the miraculous works, just to see the signs and wonders, but not to listen to the message, not truly to hear. He fulfilled prophecy, yes, with his discretion and his refusal to try to gain a high profile. Later, Mark chapter 7, the beginning of the chapter, the Pharisees and the, the priests have come from Jerusalem and they want to start a debate with him about his disciples not washing their hands. And after he puts them into their place and says it's what comes out of their hearts that, that defiles them instead of what they put into their mouths. Here he is in Capernaum, Galilee. And they're coming from Jerusalem to start putting pressure to him. And so instead of just creating a, a fight there, Mark 7, picking up at verse 24, he departs into Tyre and Sidon. He goes into a different region, and he would have no man know it. He goes to an area outside of Galilee, and he goes with the intent of being discreet, but his reputation precedes him. Why? Because he's the fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, he exercised silence and non-self-promotion even when everyone else was pro, uh, promoting him. Still in Mark 7, this time move ahead to verse 36. He leaves the region of Syria where Tyre and Sidon were. He comes back over the northern uh, borders of Galilee and he comes into the area of Decapolis. And while in Decapolis, he meets an individual with a speech impediment. Jesus opens the man's ears, loosens his tongue, and he tells the man and the witnesses, Matthew, uh, Mark rather 7, 36, he charged them that they should tell no man. There's a certain bit of irony there. This fellow's just had his tongue loosened. Now he's able to talk, and Jesus says you need to keep it to yourself. Would you be able to do that? Between you and me, that might be a struggle for this fellow. Jesus says, tell no man. Your tongue's loosed. Let's see if you'll control it. Why? Well, because he's not there simply to amass a, a mass of physical following that, that wants to see a, a show. He has far greater intent in his ministry. The same can be said of his works that followed Mark chapter 8. He comes to Bethesda. Mark eight twenty six. he heals a, a blind man. And he says to this blind man, go into the town, tell not anyone. Keep it to yourself. Time and time again, Jesus would say, shh, don't tell anyone. There were times when it was because of demons and he didn't want Satan's endorsement. There were times when it was because it was a leper and Jesus met the law's requirement. There were times when it was because of all of the misguided people that just heard the news and wanted to, to see something impressive. And he was fulfilling prophecy as he avoided unnecessary crowds as best his miracles could do. We're not devils. We're not lepers living under the law. And nor are we waiting for him to bring forth judgment unto victory. Remember a bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flax shall he not quench. That was Isaiah's prophecy as quoted by Matthew. He's accomplished all of that. Thus the go and tell no one has expired. One other concept in this idea of uh, extending the idea of the fulfillment of prophecy whenever he would say go and tell no one is the fact that he's avoiding political incitement. Mark 8, 29 and 30. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those were Peter's words. Jesus would instruct his apostles, tell no man of him. Mark 8, 30. Don't tell anyone. Peter, you keep my identity to yourself. Boy, Peter did a good job of that the night Jesus was arrested, didn't he? Tell no man. Moving forward, Mark 9, 9, they're coming down from that mountain of transfiguration. 
He's just seen Jesus manifest, uh, transfigured with Moses and Elijah. And Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, See that thou tell no one until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. They question with themselves what the rising of the dead should mean. But they kept that scene to themselves. Tell no one my identity. Tell no one of my transfiguration. Mark 9, 30. Here they are traveling through Capernaum again. Or through the regions of Galilee on their way to Capernaum. And Jesus wanted no one to know that he was in the area. He would not that any man should know it. Time and again throughout his journeys, as particularly as recorded by Mark, he was discreet. Why? Why was he so discreet at this point? The apostles realize that he's the Christ, at least cognitively. Oh, Scripture makes clear that they didn't fully understand all that that entailed. Yet they've identified him as the Christ. Why not rent a billboard? Why not run an ad on the radio? Why not let it be sounded from the hills? He's the Christ. Well, if we leave Mark's account for just a moment and think about some of the things said by an apostle named John. John noted at the end of John 2 verse 24, Jesus did not entrust himself, commit himself to men because he knew what was in man. Not all could be trusted to appreciate his identity and respond accordingly, John 2, 24. But John 4, 26, he's speaking with a Samaritan woman. And when she says, well, I know when Messiah comes, he'll straighten it all out. He'll tell us all things. Jesus told her, I that speak unto thee am he. And she left from the well, went into the city of Samaria, John 4, 29, and said, come see the man that, uh, that has told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? He did not divulge himself to the, to the Jews in the capital of their society. But he led a Samaritan woman with a reputation for ill repute to know who he was. It's not that he wanted no one to know. He only wanted those to know that would respond accordingly and properly. Why? Because he was wise and prudent. He was discreet and proper. John 5, 15 and 16, after a lame man told the Jews in Jerusalem who it was that had healed him on the Sabbath, they sought, they sought to kill Jesus. John 7, he has to be discreet about traveling for the Feast of Tabernacles because there are those that want to kill him. By the time John records chapter 10, they've come to Jesus in John 10, 26. They say, tell us plainly whether you're the Christ. And he did. He pointed out all the wonders and the words that he had given that depicted it. And then he said, I and my father are one. They didn't miss it. They took up stones to try to stone him. They realized he was the Christ and they wanted to kill him for it because they refused to accept it. Why is all of that relevant? Well, come back now to Mark's account. They wanted to kill Christ to the point that when after Lazarus was dead, the priest held a council. The chief priest said, he's going to take, uh, they all said, if we don't stop him, we'll lose our place and our nation. So the chief priest, Caiaphas, says it's prudent for him to die. We come back to Mark's record. Remember that triumphal entry? Mark 11, picking up at verse 9. What were they saying? Hosanna Oh, save us, son of David. They're recognizing him as the son of David, the, uh, the one in the lineage of Messiah. They're praising him and exalting him. In the name of the Lord. Think about the fervor as they lay their clothes in the paths, as they put the leaves across the, the road, as they celebrated his arrival in Jerusalem. But they're saying, oh, save us. And they're not saying, save us from sin. They're saying, oh, save us. And their mindset is of a physical kingdom. They think they're receiving the, their king. They're looking for the kingdom to arrive, as Mark would record. And they're expecting a kingdom that's far different from the one that Jesus is bringing. Think about the fervor. Now connect that with the fervor after Jesus fed 5,000. John 6 records, when he saw that they would take him by force and make him a king, he departed from them and went into a place alone. Think of the 
the movement, the political movement, if he prematurely declared himself to be Christ. Think about the, the, the murderous mindset from all of those councils and plots that they tried to incorporate. Think about the mayhem throughout the entirety of his ministry. Had he gone ahead and worn a jersey that said anointed on the back? No. Not only was he avoiding the devil's endorsement, meeting the law's requirement, and accomplishing prophecy's fulfillment, he was avoiding a political incitement. They wanted a political king, and that's not what he came to do. Now, there was a time coming when even the stones would want to cry out to identify him as Messiah. But throughout his ministry, on multiple occasions, he made it clear that his works and, in some instances, even his very identity needed to be used discreetly. Go and tell no one. He's no longer getting ready to die and resurrect. We're no longer waiting for him to bring forth judgment unto victory. He's done it. Go and tell no one. That applied to them. Aren't we thankful? Aren't we thankful that we don't have to keep a secret? We don't have to keep it under our hats. We can share it. There are some other occasions in his ministry where he said, Go and tell some. For instance, Mark 5, he's cast the, the legion of devils out of this man that had been living among the tombs. And when the, the people of the region find what's taken place, some 2,000 swine have died. What a uh, travesty. No pork chops for months. And then they come and they ask Jesus to leave. The man out of whom the devils were cast petitioned Jesus. He said, Lord, I want to go with you. Jesus said, you stay here. You go into your hometown, you go to your, your people, and you tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Jesus sent this man, we'll call it the Legionless Commission, because he's no longer occupied by demons. You go and you let them see what the Lord's done for you. Very next chapter of Mark, Mark 6, picking up at verse 7, there's what's called the Limited Commission. He sent the apostles out two by two to cast out demons, to heal diseases, to, to recover the disabled. He sent them out to perform miracles, to preach repentance. They had a limited audience that they were to approach. As recorded in Matthew 10, they were only go to, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They had a limited scope in terms of what they were to, to declare. Indeed, a limited commission it was. They weren't to go into all the world. They were only going to the neighboring world. You might even think of that as a training mission trip, one to get them ready for what lay ahead in the future. There was a time when he sent one man on that legionless commission. There was a time when he sent the apostles on that limited commission. And then, after he resurrected, he had an angel convey a message to the ladies. You go and you tell the disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. Mark 16, 7, the ladies had a commission. You go tell the apostles. Mark 16, 8, they went out afraid. They hurried, but they told no man, not till they got to the apostles. Their target audience was the apostles and the apostles alone. Go and tell none, or go and only tell some. Go and only tell a target audience. Aren't we thankful? that Jesus has not limited us to telling people of our own backgrounds, from our own hometowns or our own lands, and thus leaving us restricted from taking the gospel elsewhere. To some, he said, go and tell no man. Aren't we thankful that's not us? To some, he said, go and you only tell some. Aren't we thankful? That's not us. Then to others, as Mark's gospel account closes, Go ye into all the world. Where? Everywhere. Who? Every creature. Go and tell all. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. As of Math, uh, Mark 11, Jesus said, The stones want to cry out who I am. Shouldn't we be like those stones? Shouldn't we be like those that were in Jerusalem saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, O save us, except for we 
we are in a perspective where we can see and understand exactly what His kingdom is, thus bringing us to an even greater crescendo of, uh, of celebration because we have the full picture. Are we ready to cry out? Your 12-year-old daughter has just been raised from the grave. Are you going to be able to keep that to yourself? Your sight has just been restored. Will you be able to keep that a secret? Your tongue has just been loosed. You've never been able to speak right throughout your life, but now you can. Wouldn't you want to speak right away about who did it for you? We've got something better. Yes, there was the Legionless Commission, the Limited Commission, the Ladies Commission. We've been given the Limitless Commission. You go into all the world. And yes, what he said to the apostles went beyond the apostles because Matthew's account records him telling them, you teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. Matthew 28, 19. You teach them to observe what I've taught you, including the command to go teach. That's for us. He didn't say keep it a secret. He said, make it known. What do we make known? The note before me in this pulpit is one directed straight at the preacher as he stands before you today. Take them to the cross. Yes. We need to help them understand the reality of deity. Yes, we need to help them understand the integrity of Scripture. Once they've come to the point that they'll recognize the integrity of Scripture, take them to the cross. Some hearts might be pricked and eyes might be opened by realizing religious error that they've espoused. Take them to the cross. Some hearts... And I need to realize the immorality that they've embraced. Take them to the cross. Take them to the one that wept and bled in the Garden of Gethsemane. Praying for the cup to be taken. Pray for the one. To, uh, take them to the one that said, I'm he. Let these go their way. The one that endured the smiting and the, the scorning. The one that endured the spitting in his face and the slapping on his cheek. The one that endured the kangaroo court before Annas, then before Caiaphas' house, and then as the morning sun rose in front of Caiaphas again, before they took him to Pilate. The one that said, I find nothing, no guilt in this man. Oh, he's a Galilean, send him to Herod. Put on a show for us, Herod said. He said nothing. So they robed him and sent him away, making a joke of him. He comes back to Pilate. Pilate pronounces him innocent again. It's a kangaroo court. Falsely arrested. Falsely accused. Falsely tried. Falsely convicted and sentenced by a judge that said he's innocent. His face is already bloody when the crown of thorns is pressed upon him. When the scourging takes place, tattering his back to shreds. They put the scarlet robe across his back again. Removing it just in time to put what would register in our minds as about a railroad tie across it. A splintered heavy piece of wood, the patibulum, the cross piece of the cross that he would bear to Calvary. One wrist, a nail. The other wrist, nailed. Then his feet positioned, nailed. Dropped none too gently into what's essentially a post hole in the ground. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. 
Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Every breath excruciating. Every moment agonizing. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which you have received, which you have heard of me, wherein you stand, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory of that which I have preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, every bit of that at the cross was for our sins. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Take them to the cross. Take them to Calvary. Let them see the spear pierce his side. But don't stop at the cross. Because we're not stuck with a, a dead Savior. Let's take them to the tomb. The cemetery. Where they lay his body. A tomb borrowed from Joseph of Arimathea, but he didn't need it long. Because on that first Lord's Day, that first day of the week, it was empty. He'd risen. He conquered that which we spend our lives fearing. He was buried and he rose again, according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, take them to the cross. Preach the resurrection, take them to the cemetery. And stand in awe at the emptiness of the tomb. And then take them to that commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. The one that died for us. The one that rose for us. Has a command for us. Just go and tell. Would you let folks know if a doctor saved your 12-year-old? Would you let folks know if a surgeon loosened your tongue or opened your eyes, would you let folks know if a disease that had afflicted you throughout your days, preventing you from having any sort of physical contact, had been removed from you from the only one in the world that could do it? Would you let people know if a Savior who loved you from before your life was here gave His so that you could spend eternity in His presence, washing you of sins, would you let folks know? Go ye into all the world. Why do we go and tell? Because of what happened at the cross. Because of what happened in that cemetery garden. And because of what was said in that commission. Who do we go and tell? Go ye into all the world. Literally, as you are going into all the world, not just uh, travel to Nepal, not just travel to, to Europe, travel to India, travel to the Far East. No, as you are going into all the world, every time you step outside your door, every time you, you enter the room with another who's not a Christian, you're in the mission field. As you're going into all the world, preach the gospel. Share the Christ. Tell of his cross. Take them to the empty cemetery tomb. Remember the command. What do we tell? Who do we tell? And what, what do we tell to them? Let their hearts break at the pain for the price that he paid. Be willing to be patient as they consider the horrors of that hill called Mount Calvary. Be willing to let them weep and to let your eyes well with theirs as you look back at that fateful day. Take them to the price that was paid. Emphasize the power that was displayed. Uh, appeal not only to the heart that breaks over his sacrifice, but to the, the spirit 
that shouts for joy over his power, his conquering of death. And then take them to the proof. The gospel we preach is not hearsay. It's not a fairy tale. It has evidence. Above 500 brethren at once, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He was seen, he was seen, he was seen. Throughout his ministry, Jesus would tell some, go and tell no one. Others, go and tell only some. But before he ascended to his throne, he told his apostles, you go and you tell all. And you tell all that will listen to go and tell all. Thus, if I'm a soul that's heard the gospel, if I'm one that has ears to hear, then I've got a tongue to tell and a message to share. Here's the question for us this evening. Our focus is on the idea of growing together this year. Oh, we pray we're truly doing that. Growth is also to be outward. Do we wake in the morning remembering our Lord? When we look at the souls we encounter in life, do we see the loss just like He saw them? As we move forward one day at a time, do we think of it as one soul at a time? One opportunity at a time. One chance at a time. There's a chance this afternoon to obey the gospel. Maybe it's the case you've never been baptized into Christ. You've never been buried with Him by baptism into death. You've never raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. You've never confessed His sweet name. Are you ready to obey the gospel this evening? Perhaps it's the case that you're a child of God and it's time to come home. Your life has been far removed from the pattern that God has for His people. Not a single individual here can read your heart save you and you alone. Maybe it's a sin that your spouse doesn't even know. A sin your children are unaware of being in your life. A sin that, that you're loath to admit, but you've been unable to put it away. Do you need prayers? Do you need repentance? Do you need to come home? This afternoon, if you need to respond to Christ's invitation, why not take the opportunity while we stand and while we sing? We